Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And let's begin class with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your character and love and for Jesus Christ and for the blessings you've provided. We thank you that you've given us the opportunity to study and we ask that your spirit of love and truth will join us. Enlighten our minds and bring us into unity with you. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. We are doing lesson six in the quarterly, uh, the book of Revelation. And uh, as we get into lessons, there's a couple announcements I wanted to make. And first, I want to thank uh, all of our supporters here and online and around the world. And we have so many people that tune in each week. I think we're having somewhere between four and 6,000 people watch our class each week now. And so we want to thank all of you uh, for your prayers. And we want to uh, solicit more of your prayers because we've got a lot going on. And uh, I let, let you know that uh, for those who have been asking for this, we are in the middle of producing an audio version of the New Testament Remedy which we're about halfway through, so keep praying for that, that we can get that completed and, and available. And our, our plan is to make that available for free uh, when, when we do finally get it available in some platform or format, and we're still working on what's the best way to get that out there. If you have some ideas on that, email us. And then we are now in the process of producing a uh, Come and Reason, The Power of Love Training and Equipping course, which will be a two-day course in which there will be a brief 15-minute presentation and then roundtable process and work on what was presented and a 15-minute presentation and a roundtable process and working on what was presented in order to really help hone this message and, and help people uh, be able to share it more effectively. And we will have more details about that coming out uh, as we get the, you know, we got to find the place and pick time and a lot of things, but we, we've got that working. And then we've got uh, a sharing pamphlet. It's about 24 pages, a little magazine type pamphlet uh, that we're going to be releasing probably about mid-March. And I'll tell you more about that as we get closer. But, but just want to get that idea out there, get you excited about it, because I think it's really going to be a, a kind of a, a, a watershed concept that we're going to present to you guys and you can share with others. And then uh, we're in the process of launching a 15-minute radio uh, podcast that uh, will be a weekly thing. Probably going to start that in April. And then we are um, working with um, the uh, WTN uh, network to expand the, the Dr. Tim Jennings television program, and that's also um, in the works. So a lot of things going on. And, uh, and, and by the way, I still do see patients in my office. So, and, uh, so things are very, very busy. And, you, and we appreciate your prayers and support. So uh, going on to the class, see, The Sealed People of God, Lesson 6. And, uh, as we discussed... Uh, as we discuss Revelation, let's keep in mind a couple of things. The purpose of the book, which is to encourage believers in their relationship with Christ, to provide hope, to inspire better living, to motivate us to study and dig into God's word, to comprehend its mysteries, those that God would have us comprehend. Why is this the, the purpose? Because strength comes by exercise. And we grow neurobiologically, in wisdom, in character, as we study for ourselves and comprehend things for ourselves. So the book is written in a way to, to inspire you to dig in and, and comprehend and contemplate and think about as you search for truth. But what Revelation is not, it is not a test of fellowship. It is not a requirement for salvation or uh, to, uh, to uh, believe a certain interpretation of a certain symbol. It is not a crystal ball that we can map out an exact future with. And these types of applications have been made. If you don't believe the horns represent this country or that, if you don't believe this happened at this time in this event, they make it very harsh tests of fellowship and things. It's not that. It also is not an exact map of the future. But it is designed to give us hope, to inspire. So in other words, a person does not have to believe a certain interpretation of Revelation in order to be saved. They can have a different interpretation than I hold or you hold and still have a saving relation with Jesus Christ. What is required for salvation is to be restored to godliness in heart, in character, what some call being reborn with the working of the Holy Spirit, bringing the character of Christ in your heart and mind. That's what salvation is. Therefore, it's okay to have a different view 
of various elements of revelation as long as the following remain true in my view. These things need to remain true. God is always portrayed as love. God's laws are design laws. Trust and faith in God are increased by our study of revelation. Fear and distrust of God are decreased by our study of revelation. You or we grow to be more like Christ in character as we study and practice more of Christ's methods as we study. And we become engaged as workers to share the truth about God. If these things are true in your study of Revelation, we can have differences. But if if some belief you have makes you more afraid of God, makes you less likely to trust him, I would suggest to you that you're interpreting it wrong in some way. So with this in mind, let's turn to the lesson. The lesson takes the position that the seven seals begin in AD 34 at Pentecost and is a history of Christian dispensation covering the same ground as the message of the seven churches. I'm not satisfied with this explanation because it leaves out more than half of human history and begins way downstream of the opening of the Great Controversy. And if you value Ellen White, it's inconsistent with her statements about what's contained in the Book of the Seven Seals. And she says what's contained in the Book of the Seven Seals is the history of God's providences. Providences are the means, uh, which means God's creation and his care for his creation. The prophetic history of nations and the church his divine utterances and God's law, the whole symbolic council of the internal, the history of all ruling powers and nations, the beginning, uh, from the beginning of Earth's history to its close. So that's, an Ellen, that's all from Ellen White's statement about what's in the book. So to start it at 1834, you just don't get all of that. <clears throat> So I prefer an explanation that the seven seals represent God's foreknowledge from the opening of the great controversy in heaven until its conclusion, with the seals meaning the following. First seal represents Satan's rebellion in heaven. And I I'm want to spend a little minute on that because some have suggested, well, wait a minute, he's on a white horse, and there's a rider in Revelation 19 on a white horse. I want you to show you the differences between those and why they're not the same. First, the rider in Revelation 6 on the first seal has a bow which shoots, and bows shoot arrows. And in Ephesians 6, we're told that when we take up the, the, the armor of Christ, one of the things we have is the shield, and the shield is to protect us from? The arrows of Satan. The flaming arrows of the, of the evil one, or from Satan. The arrows, specifically. So this rider shoots arrows. You'll notice the, the rider in um, Revelation 19 has a sword, which comes out of his mouth, and we'll get to exactly what it's doing, but this is a sort of truth, which is a different type of a weapon. Has a crown, because this writer in Revelation in the first seal claims to be a ruler, claims to be equality with Christ, and later claims to be ruler of the earth. So a single crown claiming his, his rulership as earth. He wants to conquer. Now what? think about that, conquer. The writer in Revelation 19 doesn't seek to conquer, he makes war. Now there's a significant difference if you understand. We live in the world, we don't wage wars, the world does. The weapons you use are not worldly. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. So understanding there's conquering. What does conquering mean? Sounds like forced. It means coercive. It means to take control. It means to dominate others. It means to enslave. Conquer means to overrule some other person. But making war can be making war to actually set, set free and oppose the conqueror. And so the writer in Revelation 19 is making war with a sword that comes out of his mouth, and the sword is the sword of the Spirit, which is breaking lies, and the sword of, and the, and the sword of love. The, the writer in Revelation 19 has many crowns. The writer in Revelation 6 has one crown. Again, remember he claims to be the ruler of earth, his crown. The rider in Revelation 19 is robe dripped in blood. And then, the char- and then his, he, um, with justice, he judges and makes war. So he makes war with the sword of truth coming out of his mouth, which is restoring things to rightness or justice, which is God's design for how things work. So you see a distinction. These are not the only only thing that's similar here 
is that they have a white horse. And how did Satan begin his rebellion in heaven? By per per pretending or claiming to be interested in the welfare of others, that he was doing good. The, the second seal, uh, so the first seal, the great controversy begins in heaven. Second seal, the fall of mankind. You remember this rider takes peace from the earth in the second seal. When was peace taken from the earth? At A.D. 100? We had peace on earth until A.D. 100. That's when peace from the earth was taken. Or was peace from the earth taken when mankind fell? So seal one is the war in heaven where it began. Seal two is the fall of humankind. Seal three, the history of the human race in the Old Testament up until the time of Christ. And you see there was a real starvation. Gro darkness covers the people. Gross darkness of the people. They were starving for the word of God. And you can see this description in Desire of Ages when she talks about how the people were absolutely starving for any truth about God until Christ came. And you'll notice in the seal, they were starving, but the oil and the wine would not be destroyed. The Holy Spirit and Christ, the wine, the blood. Of, if you drink my, eat my flesh, eat my blood. The wine. Up until the time of Christ. Seal four, Christianity from the time of Christ's resurrection until and through the middle and dark ages. This is the power of the church to distort the truth by... Uh, of God and, and uh, restrict access to his word and induce pagan God concepts, all the things that it, it does to destroy, which is describing the church of the dark ages. Seal 5 is 1844, moving forward. It's the beginning of the investigative judgment with the individualities under the altar. We're in the, we're in the sanctuary altar. Souls, individualities are now given, given white robes, so they are being cleansed. The cleansing of the sanctuary is described in Seal 5. Seal 6 is the shaking, the shaking. The end time shaking of ideas where there's the rejection about God and the movement of atheism and evolutionism which are destroying the belief in God that's happening in the world today. And then we move eventually into seal seven. Today we're re reading chapter seven of Revelation and the second paragraph says, Chapter 7 is an interlude inserted parenthetically between the six and the seven seals. The sixth seal brings us to the second coming of Christ. As the wicked face judgment, Revelation 7 answers the question about who will stand on the day Christ's coming. Who will have been sealed? 144,000. The other characteristics of 144,000 are given in Revelation 5, 1 through, Revelation 14, 1 through 5. A couple questions here. What is meant by the authors when they say, that the sixth seal brings us to the second coming of Christ. Does it mean this? <clears throat> that when the seal ends, it ends with Christ coming, or that the events that follow the sixth seal, which occur under the seventh seal, will culminate with the second coming of Christ. <laughs> In other words, are there more events to follow after the sixth seal before Christ comes, or does Christ come at the end of the sixth seal. Uh, do you see my question? The, the way they worded it, it was unclear to me. It could have gone either way. That the sixth seal takes us up to the point of Christ's return, meaning he comes right then, or it takes us up to the events of the seventh seal and is the events in the seventh seal. Well, I, I, think, I actually think if we go into chapter seven and then into the seventh seal later in the lesson, that there are in fact events that come after the sixth seal before Christ actually appears in heaven. There's more events to happen. So let's read Revelation 7, 1 through 3. This is out of the NIV. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on a tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land and the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Symbolic, literal, or combination of both? Probably combination here in some way. Let's read the first paragraph in our lesson. It says, in the Old Testament, winds stand for destructive forces by which God executes judgment upon the wicked. <coughs> As the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. That was from Great Controversy. That last sentence was from Great Controversy 614. So the first sentence says that the winds 
are metaphors. This is from the lesson authors, not from Ellen White. The winds are metaphors for God's for when God executes judgment upon the wicked. The second second sentence from the Great Controversy says, as the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. So, it, first off, is Ellen White's description of the angels letting loose winds consistent with what Revelation 7 describes? Yes. So she's consistent with scripture here in describing what's happening, okay? So, is the means of harming that comes the angels using power to extend and expel power to inflict harm, or does the, uh, the, the harm come by the angels' c cessation of the use of power and letting loose what they're holding back? Yeah. It's the second, right? So, wait a second, let me finish this point. Then as the lesson suggesting, God's execution of judgment upon the wicked is passive. God judges that there is nothing more he can do for them, and so he sets them free to their own choice. Do you see what they said? The winds stand for the destructive forces by which God executes judgment on the wicked. And how do the winds get blown? God doesn't blow them. He simply stops holding them back. So is his execution of judgment a passive rather than active? Well, if you put this together, that's what the lesson is saying. Do you even think they realize they said that? Well, the two sentences are contradictory. Not really. No, the winds stand for destructive forces by which God executes judgment. I think that's right. That's exactly how he does okay, it. Okay, so it's just a methodology, whether the, he actively blows the wind right, or... Right, and the winds are let loose. The wind. Okay. Okay. Do, was it, when you read that first sentence, the wind stands for destructive forces by which God executes judgment upon the wicked, was it clear to you instantly this was a passive activity on God? Or did it, the way it was written, sound like this is something he's going to actively do? But now as we look through what the scripture says and what Ellen White says, can you see actually when the winds blow, it's not God using energy coming from him to cause it. He's actually withholding energy that's been restraining other stuff. Okay, go ahead. I'm just going to suggest you might want to read the verse referenced in Jeremiah there and provide some interpretation. So, so what's the reference? What's it say? Okay, it says, uh, Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury. A violent whirlwind, it will fall violently on the head of the wicked. Okay. And what's it mean to you? Well, I think, you know, in the light of my understanding from having been in this class many times, I would say it's God's wrath in letting, letting go and letting, you know, the evil consequences uh, fall, you know, just as he, you know, speaks of like the Babylonians as being his servant, but... So where do the winds of strife come from? Do they, winds of strife and chaos and rape and pillage and murder and destruction, do they come from God? So here is a, a quote, still with this in mind, out of a Heavenly Places, page 96. We feel depressed, greatly depressed, as we see the world and its wickedness. The professed Christian world is enveloped in the darkness that covers the earth. We sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in the land. Why is it that all this wickedness does not break forth in decided violence against righteousness and truth? It is because the four angels are holding the four winds that they shall not blow upon the earth. But human passions are reaching a high pass, and the Spirit of the Lord is being withdrawn from the earth. Were it not that God had commanded angelic agencies to control the satanic agencies that are seeking to break loose and destroy, there would be no hope. But the winds are being held until the servants of God are sealed in their forehead. What do you hear in this description? What causes the winds to blow? We do how? Our choice and our decisions. And our choice and decisions to do what? What are we doing? Depart what? from design law. Okay, what else? What's holding the winds back? The angels and his spirit, right? 
and the Spirit's being withdrawn. What causes the withdrawal of the Holy Spirit? Where's the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit on earth? And so if billions of people shut their heart to the Holy Spirit, what happens? The Spirit is being withdrawn. Is this an arbitrary point in God's life? He goes, okay, the cosmic clock says we've reached the point that I'm going to do this, and you guys weren't ready. I give you Ali Ali in free. Here I come, ready or not. Or is it that the hearts shut it out, and the hearts of human beings closing out the Spirit, the Spirit withdraws, and these events take place? And God is such a gentleman that he won't push his way in. Stand at the door and knock. You have to open the door. So here's another quote about the judgments of God. Because you will hear from the people who accept the lie that God's law, and understand, be gracious, be gracious. I understand why they do it. If you operate under the premise that God's law functions no differently than human law, it's just a system of rules. And, and therefore, the ruling authority will not enforce the rules, will not punish rule breakers. Well, then there's chaos, there's anarchy, there's no justice, there's no, there's no, there's, nothing's right. If, if you just let everybody do anything they want, you don't punish them. See, in society, we pass laws and for, for, for we have to pay taxes. And, and if you just leave, leave it up to people and like, well, they don't pay taxes, but that's okay, we don't care. And we don't enforce that, then it's not fair for all the people paying taxes. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta prosecute those who don't pay. We gotta punish them so that we can have order. It makes such almost good sense, doesn't it? But the problem is it's all predicated under the idea that God's law is just a system of rules that he has to enforce. Rather than God is creator and reality operates on certain protocols. This is reality. Yes? James 4, 1 through 3 probably will explain this trial. Go ahead and read it for us. Uh, out of the King James. Whichever. From hence comes wars and fightings among you. Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. So, so the passions are coming out from people who don't participate in God's healing plan. So here's another, here's another view of the judgments now. It's out of, uh, from Ellen White. See if you agree or disagree with what, what her thoughts were. It's out of Manuscript Release, Volume 14, page 3. I was shown that the judgments of God would not come directly out from the Lord, but upon them in this way. They place themselves beyond his protection. He warns, corrects, reproves, and points out the only path of safety then if those who have been the objects of his special care will follow their own course, independent of the Spirit of God, after repeated warnings, if they choose their own way, then he does not commission his angels to prevent Satan's decided attack upon them. It is Satan's power that is at work at sea and on land, bringing calamity and distress and sweeping off multitudes to make sure of his prey. And storm and tempest, both by sea and land, will be. For Satan has come down in great wrath. He is at work. He knows his time is short and is not restrained. We shall see more terrible manifestations of his great power than we have ever dreamed of. So do you agree or disagree? Or do you say, no, this cannot be correct. God is the ruler. He's the sovereign. He's the judge. And if he determined you're wrong, then he must use his power and he must inflict pain and suffering on you. This is just clearly heresy. Because there are many who will take this approach. They do not like the idea that God is not the active agent of pain, suffering, and death. There are organizations that are constantly criticizing our ministry on this point. Jennings doesn't believe God punishes sin. Jennings doesn't believe that God is going to use his power to torture people as long as they deserve in the fires before he kills them. It's not the same thing as saying, see, see and, I, and, and that, by the way, that's true. I don't believe that God will do that. But that's not the same thing as saying, well, Jennings believes everyone's going to be saved, that no one gets punished for sin. That's not, that's not what I say at all. There is a terrible punishment for sin. Terrible punishment. But it comes out from sin. Unremedied sin destroys the sinner. 
And God's grace is working in human hearts and minds and societies and governments and nations to hold and restrain what sin will do to this world if he wasn't restraining those terrible destructive forces to give us time. It's a big difference in the picture. One picture is the picture that Satan would have you believe of God, that he's the one who's the source of death, suffering, and pain that we need to be protected from, and we need to offer him sacrifices and hard work and even the blood of a human sacrifice. We'll offer him his son's blood, and then he'll love us. I'm trying to find it, but I can't lay my hands on it right now, but recently I read where Satan will cause fire to come from heaven. Um, perform miracles at the end of time tells people he's the one that Revelation the beast calls down fire from heaven but that's exactly what people expect so if this bright angel claiming to be Christ brings down fire from heaven people will eat that up they'll say that that's what we expect that's the God we expect to bring down heaven just like the disciples said shall we bring all down fire on these people because they reject us See, and that's the human law model. This is why so many will be deceived except the elect, including many Adventists. Because the human law model is justice requires you're held accountable by the ruling authority and the judge must inflict the proper punishments that you deserve unless you have had some legal accounting of your record. And if you haven't, then it's right and just to inflict punishment upon you for your actual wrongdoing. And since God is perfect in his knowledge, he has perfect knowledge of your wrongdoing and he would never inflict more punishment than you deserve, but it's still right and just for him to do it. That's human law model. That is why so many will be deceived. Adventists will be deceived as long as people are being punished for going to church on Sunday. And they're spared if they went on Sabbath. And as long as God punishes that, Adventists say, that's our God. We waited for him. And yet rightly understood, the, the restraint model is, is still harmonious. Because on Carmel, Satan was restrained from bringing fire down from heaven. God brought the fire down from heaven. God's restraint is removed, Satan himself will bring fire down from heaven. And like you said, many will be deceived. So we move forward here. What is the seal of God? Now, the winds are holding until the servants of God are sealed in their forehead. What's the seal of God? Ephesians 1.13, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do that seals someone? The Spirit is called the Spirit of two primary character traits of the Spirit. Truth. truth and love. Truth and love. Jesus said that it was expedient that I go. If I, don't, if I don't go, the Comforter won't come. When the Comforter comes, he's going to do something specifically. He's going to take what is mine and make it known to you. And what does Jesus possess by his achievements as a human being that we all need? perfect human character. <laughs> Remember Hebrews 5, 8, 9? Once he was made perfect, he became the source of salvation for all who obey him. Made perfect? Wasn't he always perfect? No, Jesus was always sinless. Remember, Bible perfection is maturity of character. And character cannot be created. It must be developed by the free will choices of the sentient being. And Jesus, as a human being, went through life making choices, being tempted in every way, just like we are, yet without sin. And he faced those temptations. With every one of those temptations, he chose God's per perfect design, perfect love, Greater love is no man that he give his life for a friend. And Jesus chose to give his life rather than act to save himself. Thus he restored in the humanity that he possessed the perfection of God's design for all his beings, including human beings. And thus he becomes the source of salvation. And so the Holy Spirit takes the truth that Jesus revealed about God, which dispels the lies that Satan's told about God, which restores us to trust. And when we open the trust, Romans 5.5, 5, he pours his love into our hearts and we become partakers of the divine nature. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. We get a new heart and right spirit. We have circumstances of the heart by the spirit. I mean, you see what's happening is genuine internal regeneration, transformation to be like Christ because of Christ's victory. This is the promise. This is the sealing. The Holy Spirit settles our minds, hearts, and characters into the truth and love of God such that we cannot be shaken from it. 
Through the Spirit, we become partakers of the divine nature and Christ-like. We're sealed. Second paragraph in the lesson says, In ancient times, the primary meaning of sealing was ownership. The meaning of, of the symbolic sealing in the New Testament is that the Lord knows those who are his. God recognizes his own people and seals them with the Holy Spirit. At the end of time, the seal in the forehead is given to God's faithful people who keep his commandments. It is not a visible mark put on one's forehead, but as Ellen White states, and I really like this statement, we're going to unpack it here, so listen to this statement. It's a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that God's people cannot be moved. Sealing, intellectually and spiritually settling, so you cannot be moved from that reality. So let's talk about that. What does that mean? What does intellectually mean? Did you understand? Comprehension, understanding. And I would suggest it means understanding reality and we break free from the fantasy, from the lie, from the wine of Babylon that has intoxicated the entire world. All the world drinks of the wine of fornication and they're all drunk on this certain worldview. And there's a certain worldview that the entire population imbibes in, including all Christianity, including the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There's a worldview. And that worldview, this group breaks free from. They comprehend. They're intellectually settled into the truth of God's kingdom. Such that we understand God's character and methods of love. We understand. We understand God's laws, design law, and how reality is created to function. We understand that pain and suffering and death do not come from God. They come from sin, from breaking God's designs. We understand love only works in an atmosphere of freedom and thus reject all theologies that have God in the role of cosmic executioner because then you're coerced and compelled or else a gun is held to your head. This violates the law of love and the violates the law of liberty. So this group intellectually understands all this and more. What spiritually means, settled spiritually, Intellectually, you comprehend it. Spiritually, you've incorporated it into your character such that we love, that we practice who we are in heart. We would rather die than coerce another. We would protect somebody else's freedom to believe differently than us rather than use rules or policies or politics to punish people who believe differently than us. Thus the saved are described in Revelation with these words. Revelation 12, 11. These are they who do not love their life so much as to shrink from death. That survival drive, that need to protect self has been replaced with love and they would rather die than live outside of God's design. And partly spiritually could be actually having a relationship with God. Well, you can't have what I just said without a relationship with God. But I just wanted to clarify that because there's an intellectual, spiritual kind of people who understand or believe they do and feel like they get it and so on, but they really don't, they really don't experience a relationship with God every day. They don't interact. They read the Bible for facts, but they don't understand that it's a conversation. Those are the five foolish virgins in the, in the parable. They had their lamps, but they didn't have oil. They're intellectually into the truth, but they're not spiritually into the truth. They're not indwelt by the Spirit in a living relationship, as you're describing. And the, the door guy at the door, when they tried to get in, said, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know you. Well, <clears throat> really, it meant they didn't know him. But knowing God is, is more than just an intellectual understanding about God. It's, it's a, no, a, recognizing his voice when you hear it, because you've heard it so often already. You know, understanding when he asks you to do something or not. You know, experiencing God is a big part of... Uh, so intellectually is the cognitive understanding. Spiritually is the part that that's how you live in heart. That's who you are. And that comes from a relationship with, with God. So let me give you some examples now. A person can understand cognitively, intellectually, that smoking is unhealthy and causes cancer yet have no desire to quit smoking. They would be an example of someone who settled 
intellectually, they know the truth of it, but they're not settled spiritually in the way they live. Does that make sense? How about this one? An alcoholic may be convinced that they have to quit because of liver failure and multiple DUIs. So they don't drink anymore and they attend AA meetings, but they long to drink. They dream about the days they used to drink. They wish they could figure out a way they could drink without experiencing more damage, but they still don't drink because they're afraid of dying if they do. These are, by the way, in AA called dry drunks. <laughs> That's what they're called, dry drunks. They are settled intellectually about the truth and even behaviorally. But have they had a change of heart? Their hearts have not changed. They are not spiritually settled. Now, the lesson mentioned, these are the people who keep the commandments of God. Let's talk about that. The idea of keeping me in the, in the point of the ceiling. Can someone keep the commandments of God and not be settled into the truth spiritually? No. Yes. Can someone be like the dry drunk, afraid of the consequences of sinning, so they obey the rules, but their hearts really prefer to do it another way, but they don't do it another way because they don't want to get punished and they don't want to demerit in their legal account in heaven. These individuals would not be sealed. What is the mark of the beast? Settling into mind and heart the methods of the beast. Coercive imposition and willfulness to punish others who disobey the rules that you think they should follow. The beastly methods of human governments. Third paragraph says the faithful of God sealed people has been tested in every generation. However, the test of faithfulness in the final crisis will be the keeping of God's commandments. In particularly, the fourth commandment will become a test of obedience of God. As the Sabbath has been the sign of God's people in biblical times, so will be a sign of loyalty to God in the final crisis. You know, we couldn't escape this discussion. You see, this, is a, this, this particular view, what law lens do you look through? See, if you, if you operate under the law lens of the human law, they lo the people who operate on that law, they love this idea because it's very tangible, it's very practical, it's very measurable, it's very behavioral, it's something that I can claim, something that I can do, and as long as I do it, and I have my TV off before sunset, I never have water above my knees on the Sabbath, I, don't go, I can wave, but I don't swim, I never ride my bike more than 10 miles an hour on Sabbath, uh, you know, it's, as long as I keep all the right rules and observe the Sabbath, I'm seal of God, I'm going to seal. Don't get gas in your car on Sabbath. Don't eat out on Sabbath. I mean, on and 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 on. Buy your certificate ahead of time so you can eat out on Sabbath. Just don't use cash or a credit card on Sabbath. That's all good. On and on we go. And when you crucify Christ, make sure he's off the cross. That's right. And when you crucify Christ, be sure he's off so you can keep the Sabbath. This is exactly the corruption in the Adventist church. Because I would say... When you think about the Sabbath as a seal of God, what law lens are you understanding the Sabbath through? If you run the Sabbath through the human law lens and teach it like human law, this is a rule that God made up. It's sacred to him because he's holy and he will monitor your behaviors to make sure you adhere to this rule. And if you break this rule, God will punish you for breaking the rule. You are actually promoting the system of the beast. You're not promoting the seal of God. I was just curious about, you know, the Bible talks about the mark of Cain. The difference between the use of the word sealing and marking. You know, Cain was all upset because now, I mean, he really didn't want to ask his brother for the sacrifice because he was the gardener and his brother was the shepherd and he'd have to ask his brother to give something to the Lord and he didn't feel like asking his brother. So he brought what he wanted to bring to the Lord and the Lord had a discussion with him after he killed Abel and said, well, because this, bad things are going to happen. And uh, Cain says, well, anyone, who, you know, you, you put me from your presence. I'm going to be a restless wanderer. You know, this is too hard. And he said, people who find me will kill me. So he said, I'm gonna, I'll put a mark on you. 
In this instance, God put a mark on him to enable him not to suffer the consequences that he feared suffering. But I just... And how does that have to do... You brought that up. What's the connection to our discussion today? Well, we talk about the seal of God, and then we turn around and talk about what is the mark of the beast. You know, um, to me, the mark of the beast is people who, who fear suffering the consequences. You know, they, they don't love God. They don't really want... They wouldn't be happy in heaven the way it's set up. So, um, you know, I... I they want to go in that direction, but they mainly suffer the con they don't want the consequences of their life. Much like Cain didn't want the consequences of his Yeah, I, I, I am I'm not going to disagree that ultimately they will go through that experience. However, I don't think that's a defining or di differentiating mark in the time in which we're living. And here's why. Because there will be many people who do not experience that fear because they're keeping the right rules and they're observing the right day, and they're punishing the right heretics, and they know in their heart that they're doing exactly the right thing, and therefore they're not afraid. They will only experience that fear when reality breaks through and they see that they were wrong all that time. So I don't think that the mark would be helpful. That mark of fear is gonna be necessarily helpful in the day in which we live for those who have settled into this coercive lie because they have comfort from the rule keeping and the punishing of others. But ultimately they will experience that fear. But I think the mark is much more easy to see because we really can't see the fear in someone's heart anyway, but we can absolutely see the methods that they practice. And the methods of the beast are always methods. The, the, and it gives you in Revelation, the beastly method, no one can buy or sell, save him who has the mark of the beast. What, what, what method is that? That's coercion. If you don't do it, we'll use some type of power over you. We would call that in modern day economic sanctions. Think that through, that's what it is, economic sanctions. And which system leads the world in economic sanctions? No buying or selling, except you accept the mark. And so I think that in the end, it will be using those things for conscience coercing reasons. And when we see people willing to put coercive pressure on people because of differences in conscience, that's the beastly system. And where the Sunday and the Sabbath come in, they stand as signs or marks or flags or pennants of two systems of government. The Sabbath, its origins, it was created as a day of rest and points to the creator and his laws, which are design laws in its institution. The Sunday become a day of rest by legislation, human law. So one, set, one day is a flag. See the flag of the United States here? It's a flag. It's a symbol. It's a sign of this government. That is not this government. It's merely a sign or representation. All over the world you wave that. Everyone in the world knows that's a representation of this government. But it is not this government. You could wave that flag or wear it on your uniform like the Nazi soldiers did that infiltrated our lines during World War II, put on the U.S. uniform and the flag. They were wearing it. They weren't on our side. They were trying to do harm. You can have the Sabbath. You can have the right day. You can wave it, but still practice Satan's methods of coercion and teach people God is a God of inflicted punishment and, the, and, just, and, and, and infiltrate God's church to cause confusion. The true Sabbath keepers are those who represent the government of God for which the Sabbath stands and is a sign. And the government of God is truth, love, freedom. These are his principles. And this is how he wins. And so the true Sabbath keepers all week long practice those principles and how they treat others. And if they have knowledge of this day and what it stands for, they celebrate and are thankful for the day. That they have this day each week to, as an evidence of how God operates his universe. But even if they don't have knowledge of the day and they practice those same methods of God, they still receive the seal of God. Yes. So what you've just said maybe then explains, this is a quote from Great Controversy, page 639. The enemies of God's law from the ministers down to the least among them have a new conception of truth and duty. 
Too late they see that the Sabbath of the fourth commandment is the seal of the living God. Too late they see the true nature of their spurious Sabbath and the sandy foundation upon which they have been building. Right. This is not about the days. They're about what the days stand for and represent. So Monday's lesson, Revelation uh, 7, 4 through 8. I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000. I'm not going to read all of 12 tribes. Uh, this is a symbolic or literal number? Uh, symbolic represented. Uh, who, who is symbolically represented by this group? Well, that's one view, exactly. One view. It says in the first paragraph, the announcement of the number of those who are sealed marks the completion of the sealing. John hears the number is 144,000 of the 12 tribes. The reference here is not a literal number, but to, sig uh, to what it signifies. The number 144,000 consists of 12 times 12 uh, times 1,000. Uh, 12 is a symbol of God's people. The tribes of Israel and the church were built upon the foundation of the 12 apostles. Thus, the number 144,000 stands for the totality of God's end time people, all Israel. Um, Jews and Gentiles who are ready for Christ's return and who will be translated without seeing death. So, symbolically represents either, and I'm going to tell you one possibility is what they say. That's not the only possibility, but it is possible. This could be what it means. Uh, I, I actually like another, another view, but again, it's not something we have to be hard and fast on. The, the 12 tribes, if you remember in the Old Testament, were on the four corners, of the, uh, four corners uh, north, three on the north, three on the east, three on the west, three on the south. So it represents symbolically peoples from all over the world in the symbolism there. So the 12 tribes here at the end of time represent peoples from all over the world. I think we would all agree with that. There are two possibilities. One is represents 144,000 represents the saved, the great multitude, and the 140,000 are exactly the same at the end of time. Or that they represent two different groups. The 144 is a subset of all the saved. Um, one piece of evidence identifying the 144,000 that the lesson didn't address, I'm going to address, is in verse 3. And in verse 3, it describes the 144,000, the sealed, as, quote, the servants of God, or the servants of our God. And in Bible symbolism, servants are a, a, a attributed to a specific group. And I'm going to just give you some of the text from the Old Testament. There's many more. And I want you to notice how widespread through the Old Testament you find this. 2 Kings 17, 23. Until the, Lord until the Lord removed them from his presence, and he had warned, as he warned through all his servants, the prophets... That's Kings. Here's Ezra, uh, 9, 10, 11. And now, our God, and now, O oh, our God, what can we say after this? For we have disregarded the commands you gave through your servants, the prophets. Jeremiah 7, 25. From the time your forefathers left Egypt until now, day after day, again and again, I sent you my servants, the prophets. Ezekiel 38, 17. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Are you not the one I spoke of in my former days by my servants, the prophets. Daniel 9, 6. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke, to, spoke in your name to our kings. Amos 3, 7. Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. Zechariah 1, 6. But did not my words and my decrees which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your forefathers? Did you notice how many different Bible writers refer to the servants of God as his prophets? The 144,000 are specifically called the servants of God. Well, when we think about prophets, these are not primarily people who prognosticate or predict future events. The prophets that are being referred to, if you notice historically through the Old Testament, are people who lived in that time and came from God to the people at that time for a message for them at that time. They were his spokespersons. Here's a message for you, reform and whatever. And so one possible interpretation is the 144,000 represent an end time people who have an end time message for the people living on earth at the end of time. They're his spokespersons. So one could read Revelation 144 that God sends his angels saying, hold, hold, hold until the 144 from all people groups of the world because they're all 12 uh, tribes are represented. So everybody all around the world, there's a group of people that are settled both intellectually and spiritually into the truth of the great controversy and the whole story and their characters reflected. And then four winds begin loosening 
And that causes more upset and chaos on earth, and that causes people to begin asking, what's going on, what's going on? This group, having already been sealed or on the scene all over the world, to give a witness, to give a message. And from their message, a great multitude is saved. That's another possibility. Then they represent the same group. But there's evidence that, that, that supports the idea that the 144,000 and the great multitude are the same group. I kind of like the, the version I just gave you, but, but there's evidence to support that may not be right. Here, here's the evidence uh, that I think would be probably the most significant that Adventists would point to. It's out of early writings, page 36. It says, I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary. And then will come the seven last plagues. So some might take the position that because the sealing happens while he's in the sanctuary, and it isn't until he finishes sealing people that the four winds are loosened, therefore that both groups here have to be the same group because they won't be sealed after he leaves the sanctuary. Does everybody follow why they might make that argument? I can see that argument. However, that's why we always want to read widely. Here's another quote from Ella White out of 15 manuscript release, 86. The time of trouble is before us. The angels are, as it were, just loosening the four winds, but they cannot loose them yet. The church is too far behind her privilege. The people are too indolent. Many are unfaithful. So another view or that the angels are in the process of loosening, but they haven't fully loosed the winds. And during the process of loosening, the 144,000 are sealed and give their witness. And from their witness, a great multitude is saved. And after that group is saved, then the four winds are fully loosed. Thus, the loosening isn't a single moment in time. It's a process of gradually letting go, consistent with hearts hardening around the world and the spirit gradually being withdrawn. So I still like my version, even with the other quote. And remember, there's a quote earlier that I think fits with, with my version that I want to just remind us of, because I noticed that. Yes, so uh, it is Satan's power that is work on sea and land, bringing calamity and distress. Remember this quote? For Satan is coming down with the creator. He is at work. He knows his time is short, and he is not restrained. We shall see more. So not restrained would be he's being loosened. Okay? So that kind of quote fits with my view as well. So there's a hand over here. Yes? It would make sense to me for the 144,000 to be a certain group of people who are sealed to go out to make sure the multitude yep. becomes sealed. Yep. That's exactly how I'm, I, I think it is, too. Uh, I don't think they're exactly the same group. I think they are two groups. But... I can see from that one quote why people would want to make them the same group. And I'm not going to argue with them. It's okay. It's the same group. That's fine. In, in fact, um, we're, let's, let's move on to Tuesday's lesson. I'm trying to get maybe through some more of this because there's more good stuff in the lesson. And I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Combination of literal and symbolic, you know, literal great multitude, literal uh, from all over the world, but the Lamb is clearly symbolic of Jesus, and white robes are symbolic of healed character, palm branches are symbolic of their triumph over sin, so a combination of literal and symbolic. First paragraph, it says, John sees a great multitude which no one could count, who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That is, they are a special group of people who, despite whatever tribulations they went through, have stayed faithful to Jesus. Faithful, faithfulness symbolized by their being covered in the robes of his perfect righteousness. The word tribulation is used very frequently in the Bible to refer to the things that believers suffer for their faith. Therefore, although some Adventists interpret this view, interpreters view this group as another representation of 144,000, we could understand the great multitude as reference to all redeemed who have suffered for their faith down through the ages. So they're actually here allowing for another interpretation as well, that the 144,000 is not just those who came out of it, but, excuse me, the great multitude is not the same as 144,000, it's more inclusive and broader than just 144,000. So regardless of whether we view the two groups differently or the same, 
What is God waiting for in order to let loose the four winds and bring about the final events that lead to Christ? That's the critical question. It's holding, holding, holding until an event happens. And when that event happens, then things begin loosening up and, the, and it leads us to the second verse. What is he waiting for? What's the critical thing? What? Yes. <laughs> uh, what are you waiting on us? He's waiting for the 144, whatever that group is, to be sealed. He's waiting for their sealing. Being so settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, they can't be moved. He's waiting for that group of people to settle. And once they settle, then the things really loosen up. Do you understand? You have a role to play in your personal settling. You have a role to play in your personal sealing, intellectually and spiritually. Wrestling out the truth, uh, inviting in the Holy Spirit, wrestling out maybe some things that need to be re rejected and gotten rid of in your beliefs and or practices. There, we have a role to play in being settled so we can't be moved. The last paragraph, it says, Nearest to the throne are those who were once zealous in the cause of Satan, but who plucked as, branches, as brands from the burning have followed their Savior with deep, intense devotion. Next are those who perfected Christian character, characters in the midst of falsehood and infidelity, those who honored the law of God when the Christian world declared it void, and millions of all ages who were martyred for their faith. And beyond it is the great multitude which no number could count of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, palms in their hands. Uh, their warfare is ended. The victory is won. They have run the race and reached the prize. The palm branch in their hand is a symbol of their triumph, and the white robe an emblem of the spotless righteousness of Christ, which is now theirs, which now is theirs. And then right below it in the green section, it says this. Yes, we are covered with the, with the righteousness of Christ, a gift of faith. What does it mean to be covered by the robe of Christ's righteousness? Do you find significance in the fact that the lesson authors in the green section state we are covered with the robe of righteousness, but in the sentence immediately before, in the last paragraph, Ellen White says, the palm branches represent in their hands is a symbol of their triumph, while the white robe, an emblem of the spotless righteousness of Christ, which now is theirs. Does the phrase covered by the robe of Christ's righteousness immediately sound the same to you as possessing the righteousness of Christ, having a character that has been perfectly healed so that you possess that righteousness? Does that sound the same to you? Hmm. See, and what is an emblem? It's a symbolic representation of something. So Ellen White is saying that the white robes are a symbolic representation of a reality, and that reality is that the save have. The save possess in their being the righteousness of Christ and are not the unrighteous simply covered by a robe that hides their unrighteousness. They're actually righteous. Why do you think the lesson authors didn't quote it this way? Didn't say this. Yes, we are transformed and healed to be righteous like Christ. A gift of faith. You see, that would have been so much more beautiful and accurate. We are covered by the robe of righteousness and a gift of faith. Okay, that remains symbolic language, which requires interpretation. And sadly, because of the imperial law construct, the vast majority that here you're covered with the robe of righteousness here that you're going to stand before the judge. You're going to be a corrupt sinner on the inside. But when he looks at you, you've got this like magic shield, this thing that covers you. So when he looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees the perfection of Jesus standing between you and your, and your ugliness. So he will declare you to be righteous even though you're not. That's penal substitution fraud. It's a lie. Ellen White says when she uses the metaphor of the, of the covering, and she uses the metaphor, but she tells you what it is. And this is Christ's Object Lessons 3.11. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged with his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought in captivity to him. We live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Then as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of God. Why does he see it? Because it covers our wickedness? Or because we are possessors in heart, mind, and character of the character of Christ? No longer I live, but Christ lives around me and over me like a shield bubble. No, he lives in me. 
This is a completely different message, and this is design law. And this is why Satan loves the imperial law, loves penal substitution, because it cheats people, teaches them that they're never going to be righteous, they're always going to be sinful and sick, but it's okay because Jesus is there in heaven to plead their case to a father who would kill you if he didn't, if he saw you, but don't worry, you're covered even though you're still unrighteous, and you'll never really be righteous until he comes at the second coming. Well, you know, there's some quotes from Ella White that says when he comes to the second coming, he's not going to heal anybody and remove sin. If it's going to be done at all, it has to be done before the second coming. And so penal substitution cheats people. And there's a couple more things I'd like to go through, if that's okay, about uh, Revelation 14, 1 through 5, the, the characteristics of the 144. It says, I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on the Mount of Zion, and with them 144,000, and had the name of his fa uh, Father written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was that of a harpist playing their harps. And they sang with a new song the throne, uh, before the throne and, and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They followed the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. I'm going to go through those elements. We're going to have to go through fast. Um, the, here's the chief characteristics. They did not defile themselves with women. They kept themselves pure. They followed Jesus wherever he goes. No lie was found in their mouth, and they were blameless. Let's go through those really quick. What does it mean? Well, does this mean of uh, people who take a vow of men who take a vow of cel celibacy? They they don't follow women. No, no, no. Women in Bible are symbolic of systems of religion. The pure woman is God's church. The harlot represents false systems of religion. So what does it mean not to defile themselves with women? They did not embrace in heart, mind, and character the false, distorted systems that teach lies about God. Does this mean though that they always had every detail and every fact of Scripture correctly understood? It does not mean that. Or that they never embraced and valued principles uh, that are contrary to God's character. That's what it means. They never, they never valued those principles that are uh, against God's character. They wouldn't coerce or kill others in God's name, for instance. What about those who follow Jesus? Would this mean that they are lovers of the truth and are willing to have their ideas changed and improved and advanced as more truth unfolds to them? Whereas those who won't follow Jesus refuse advancing truth and hold to historic traditions. So the metaphor of the sanctuary, when Jesus moved from the holy place to the most holy place, what is the truth that was to be understood and embraced by those who follow him? As he's moving in the symbolic system, he's moving from a holy place to most holy place, there's a new truth, a new enlightenment, a new understanding of reality. And what's it supposed to be? And I will submit to you the essential truth of that shift was that God is creator. We are to worship him who made the heavens, the first angel's message the earth, sea, and all of them in the midst, we see that God's law is not like human law. And the significance of the Sabbath as a sign and a flag and an emblem that we wave of the creator and his design laws. And we worship him who made the heavens and the earth. And we reject the imperial law construct. Thus, all those who are still teaching in the Seventh-day Adventist church that God's law functions like human law and God's the source of inflicted pain, we call it justice, are not following where Jesus leads. They are like the Jews 2,000 years ago who would not accept the truth that Jesus was Messiah. And even though they had all the Old Testament ritualistic stuff that was given by God, and it was truth for a time, once they rejected Jesus' its fulfillment, all those rituals became dark to them. And what happens in the Seventh-day Adventist church when people promote the Sabbath or sanctuary, or any other doctrine through the imposed law lens. What happens when they do that? Instead of enlightening people, it darkens the minds of people. <clears throat> Thursday's lesson, we're going to finish with this um, part. No lie was found in their mouth. It means, does that mean that every word they ever uttered in their entire life was 100% factually correct? Is that what that means? <clears throat> really, think about that. No lie was found in their mouth. Does it mean they never told someone they liked their hairdo when they really didn't like their hairdo. <laughs> Does it mean that? No lie was found in their mouth. They never, they never, they, they, they didn't tell somebody they liked their dress when they didn't like the dress. Th Does it mean they never said, no, mommy, I didn't take the candy with chocolate all over their lips? Is that what it means? No lie was found in their mouth. Does it mean this kind of stuff? You understand a lot of people think that's what it means. Does it mean they never in their life said anything about God that was not true? Does that mean that? Or could it mean this? 
They never said anything about God that wasn't true once they were sealed. Amen. And called by him to be one of his end time spokespersons. In other words, in their end time witness about God, they told the truth about God, but they grew in their journey to get there. What do you think? What does it mean to be blameless? Well, Ephesians 1, 4, for he chose us in himself before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. If a child is born with HIV because they had two parents that were HIV positive, is the child to blame? Or is the child blameless? Blame, blameless. 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 But as the, as the child grows to the age of accountability and there's a remedy freely offered that will cure the HIV and offered and the child understands and the child rejects the remedy, do they remain blameless? So what does it mean to be blameless? That we're sinless? No, we're not to blame for being born sinners. You are not to blame. blame. You are not blamed for the fact that you were born in sin and conceived in iniquity. It's not your blame. But if you refuse the remedy offered by Jesus Christ to be restored, to be reborn, to be recreated, to have the law written in your heart and mind, to be renewed, if you refuse that, that's what you'll be blamed for. So those who are blameless are those who have accepted all that Christ offers them in order to heal and restore them. They're the healed. They're the regenerate. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you've provided through Jesus Christ, that when Adam and Eve broke trust with you, infected humankind with fear, selfishness, deviance from your design, a terminal condition, that you didn't abandon us, that you intervened, you stepped in, you took upon yourself this horrible condition in order to overcome and cure and offer us a free remedy to restore us back into your perfect design. And we ask that your spirit will take all that Christ achieved, reproduce it in us, that we can be sealed, settled, both intellectually, we can understand and see the clarity of your kingdom and discern and differentiate it from the infection of Satan's lies and that we can practice and live in harmony with your designs and be settled and sealed and witnesses for you and then the end will come and we can see you soon. Amen.